one of our favorite programs here, the Nurse Leadership Board, Teresa Maselli, once again, all those acronyms, but she's from the Mayo Clinic Rochester. Now, I broke my pencil earlier, so I'm sharpening it while you guys go on, but please listen to this. It's fantastic. Take it away, Teresa. All right, Kelly. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me. And yes, I'm Teresa Maselli. I'm a registered nurse at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and I've spent... Oh, Dr. Cole had said he didn't want to say, but I've spent the last 30 years working in the area of blood and marrow transplant. And I'm really excited to be here with Kelly, with the entire team. Uh, truly, one of my favorite things is to participate in these meetings, as well as to facilitate my support group, which is um, in Rochester. However, it is virtual, so anybody can attend if you so choose. Happy to have you participate. Um, you know, I really want to have a sort of a conversation more about how to be empowered. To be your own self advocate provided fabulous information. And I have to tell you, it's a little hard to meet the energy level of Dr. Costello. She was worried about uh, meeting or following Dr. Cole, but I'll tell you, the two of them are just... But when you think about all these treatment options, as Dr. Costello talked about, you know, that it's really confusing for people, and it's not just confusing for you as a patient or caregiver, it's really confusing for for the care providers, your health care team, because you know, with the riches that we now have, sequencing therapy can be challenging. And as Dr. Costello nicely outlined, we really have to look at multiple facets. We have to look at what does the most recent data show? Now that CAR-T has been approved, where is that going to sit in a person's uh, whole treatment trajectory or journey? What are your preferences and your goals? And what is your healthcare provider's clinical experience and access to some of these therapies. And so with all of that, we come to a treatment decision and we really want for you to be a part of that treatment decision. And I'm hopeful that I can give you some tools to help you be self-advocating, to feel empowered. Um, we kind of went with a galactic theme here because of 2020 with the, the mission to Mars 50th anniversary. And so really, Scotty, we need more power. We want you to really be engaged with the decision-making process. So how can you do that? Understanding your treatment options is really key. The education that is needed to stay abreast of all the therapies that are now available and the combinations that can be used. Sources of information like today's session is invaluable. We really want people to be engaged with their support groups, with the IMF's educational uh, offerings, such as the workshops, as well as what's online. Be a part of that decision making. And some of that has to do with having the confidence to come with questions. You don't have to necessarily have all the answers, but you need to be a part of that decision making uh, to create the dialogue, to really determine what your goals and values and preferences are. When you're newly diagnosed, your immediate goal is, I want to understand, I want to live, um, and, and throughout the trajectory of this disease. But we really need to be thinking about quality of life so that when we look at your goals, your priorities, your preferences, we can come to a mutual decision on how to approach treating your myeloma, whether it's newly diagnosed or in a relapsed stage. So when we think about communicating, it's not just your goals and preferences, but it's important to talk about your symptoms, whether it be physical or emotional. All too often, uh, issues such as anxiety and depression are not brought to the table for discussion. And we really need to have conversations because the mind and the body connection is so strong. It's helpful if you can keep a symptom diary, maybe days after dex, you're finding that you are hugely down and that's 
worsening your depression or while you're on decks, you're having significant issues with anxiety. It's important to keep that diary so that you can discuss it with your providers. Fatigue is experienced by the majority of patients from prior to being diagnosed uh, throughout the entire trajectory of the disease. And all of these things can have an impact on your quality of life and your willingness to continue therapy. And of course, if you're not on effective therapy or being able to stay on effective therapy, the outcome uh, becomes more dim. And so it's important that we discuss all of these issues uh, whether it be physical symptoms or emotional symptoms that come from the diagnosis, that come from the treatment, so that we can address them to help you stay on therapy longer. Many people really, really struggle with dexamethasone. And so with that in mind, if you are struggling and you're saying, I'm just going to stop it, well, maybe you need to talk about this so that we can consider a dose adjustment rather than a whole discontinuation of that medication. So when you're thinking about communicating with your team and preparing for your, your next meeting with your provider, it's helpful to write down your questions ahead of time. It's easy as we experience chemo brain, and I always tell my patients, since they have chemo brain by association, that you want to write down the questions when they come to your mind. Different medications as well as your supplements uh, to your next appointment. Be sure to bring with updates in what has been happening in your life, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. It's important that we know what's happening in your life um, so that we can help you with that decision-making process. And have any of your symptoms changed? Have they gotten better? Have they gotten worse? I have a number of people that have sort of a, a non-experience with neuropathy until one day it just starts to happen. And you can even send online messaging for many people who have what are the, the portal um, to your healthcare provider so that these things can maybe even be addressed before your next visit. So when you're at your appointment, what are the important aspects of that. You wanna be able to speak up. You wanna have a relationship with your healthcare team that you feel comfortable bringing your questions. Even for people who are worried about having a stupid question, there are no stupid questions. Um, we wanna make sure that you are having your concerns and your side effects and your needs being met. But please do make sure that the most important questions are the ones that are being asked first. You may think, and your healthcare provider uh, would like for you to think that you're the only person they're seeing that day, but quite honestly, you know that there's somebody else who has important questions next. So make sure that those questions are being addressed. Understand your plan of care and what your next steps are, your follow-up plan, your next line of therapy. Uh, when are you having your next infusion, whether it be a bone strengthener or daratumumab or some other therapy. Understand what the next steps are in your plan before you leave. And if you do have questions after you leave, know how you can reach your care team, whether it be through the portal, uh, through uh, phone calls, but make sure that, that you know how to reach your care team after you leave. It is helpful, especially during pivotal meetings, whether it be at the time of being newly diagnosed, where there's maybe a change in therapy, at a relapse, or some key elements. It can be helpful to have a caregiver be a part of that meeting as another set of ears. Now with COVID-19, that, that having extra people being present can be challenging uh, due to limitations at healthcare centers, but that doesn't mean they can't be present by phone. And so I'm always very comfortable with people dialing in somebody during our visit or even recording our visit. So that's something that you can check with your healthcare provider if they're comfortable with the recording that you can listen to again later. Because later, uh, you know, when you navigate home, when you get home, it's gonna be important to be able to digest all the information that you've received. And maybe you need to be the connecting link between other healthcare, farm, uh, healthcare members of your team, whether it be a primary care physician, your pharmacist, uh, your special order pharmacist, um, know what changes have been made, take the notes, and if you don't recall, send a portal, get an update, uh, copy off your medical record uh, in the most recent visit. You can review many of those things uh, through the electronic healthcare record. 
always feel free to follow up with your healthcare team if there are missing components uh, to, to the meeting. In the day of uh, COVID or in our current era, one of the best things that I think have happened are virtual meetings like this, where I can be in Minnesota um, and be joining you in San Diego, as well as telemedicine. Telemedicine has been amazing. And I've enjoyed many of my telemedicine visits with my patients because they're in the convenience of their own home. I can actually get a little look around and see how they're doing physically and functionally within their household. This is also a possible option for a second opinion. Maybe those of you in California have always wanted to have a second opinion with somebody at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, but you were afraid of the snow. Okay, I'll tell you, there's not a drop of snow to be seen in my neighborhood right now. Um, but this is also something that has become very popular as a second opinion virtual visit. There's a lot of planning that can go with that, and some of that is not too different than what we've already talked about for a face-to-face -face visit. Um, but maybe you need to be planning your blood work in advance, having it done a couple of days ahead of time so those results are available with your healthcare team, whether it be through Epic or through a fax um, or that you can share with them when you're at the meeting virtually. Be understanding of the technology. Not everybody is techno savvy. Know what the setting is that you're going to be in. Like right now, I'm in my quiet office with some mood lighting. My dog is in the backyard. So, And my cat, thankfully, hasn't uh, kitty bombed our meeting today. But know what your session, your your meeting session is going to be like. Maybe you need to expose a certain part of your body. Wear a piece of clothing that's easier uh, to show whatever skin body part may need to be shown. Uh, know that your Wi-Fi is strong enough. I know that my connection is sometimes uh, disabled uh, during my meetings, and that can be a little bit frustrating. If you have a blood pressure cuff at home, take your vital signs. Do your heart rate. Uh, those are things that are easy enough for us to show you how to do. And if you're running into blood pressure issues, we'd like to know that. So by the time we're done with our, our virtual visit, it's always nice to know what's our next step, whether it be virtual or in person. Every now and then, it's really nice to have an in-person visit. What are the next tests that we're going to be doing? How about medication refills? Is there anything that you need refilled um, as, as part of this visit? So it's important to engage with your healthcare team. And I think really important is to understand who all the members are of your crew to make this a successful journey. Are you meeting with your general he monk? And as Dr. Costello said, she really recommends that uh, people have a myeloma specialist, whether you see them once a year at pivotal times when changes in therapy need to be addressed. Um, who are the healthcare team members that you rely on? I have a number of patients that seek me out specifically because we've had a long-term relationship and we want to, uh, you know, connect and I understand what their needs are. How about subspecialists, whether it be your orthopedist, maybe an infectious disease specialist, if you've had some issues with infection. So know who to go to for what concerns. You really want to spend your myeloma specialist and general hemonc time on your myeloma, you want your primary care provider to be addressing things like hypertension, blood sugar management, thyroid issues. And please don't forget your family and support network. That includes um, the, so the support group that, that you may be attending, um, family, whether it be through Zoom and Skype type meetings, uh, they are an essential part of this group. Central to the care team, of course, is you and your caregiver. And I will say that truly essentially is the caregiver within this crew of, of team to make this a successful journey. For the majority of myeloma care, people are cared for on an outpatient basis. So that responsibility that goes to you as the myeloma survivor and your caregivers can be pretty tremendous, not only taking care of those medications day to day, but contacting that healthcare team and the proper healthcare team member when something new comes up. Myeloma patients need support from 
many areas, but the caregiver also needs support. And so when we think of formal and informal caregivers, um, look at who is supporting whom. I encourage people to have multiple informal caregivers, people that you can call upon within your community. Um, I know that we have to be very careful right now with COVID as far as how closely we're exposed, but there's nothing wrong with picking up the phone and having a conversation. Caregiver duties um, can, can be stressful. Um, I want you to be sure as a caregiver, because I know that there are probably two people per computer right now for many of these these people attending, caregivers need to be able to help themselves as well as help the, the myeloma survivor. When, when you're on an airplane a year ago now uh, for myself, they always say, make sure that you put the oxygen mask on yourself before you help somebody else. And that's true as a caregiver. If you're, if you're unable to help yourself, you're not going to have the energy to help the person who needs it. And so these next few slides really do pertain to both the caregiver as well as the myeloma survivor. Survivor, We want to think about ways of adding to a healthy or healthful lifestyle, diet. There are a lot of approaches and ways that we can do this. Um, are helping to manage stress through mind and body connection, through rest and relaxation, meditation. Uh, activity can be very helpful in helping to manage stress. There are complementary and, in and integrative therapies that can also be helpful from massage. If you have myeloma bone involvement, you want to be careful about massage and that it's not too deep. But a gentle massage or acupuncture can be very helpful in ways of managing different aspects of pain like neuropathy. You also want to do general health care screening. Unfortunately, having myeloma doesn't get, get you an out-of-jail-free card for other health-related issues. And in some ways, it can add to those uh, health needs as far as health screening. So important is to think about the whole mind and body connection. Making sure that you're maintaining a healthy body weight, which for many, myself included, COVID-19 has meant COVID-19. And so working back on, on trying to get to a healthy weight, healthy activity, eating vegetables, fruits, the whole grains, trying to reduce those high fat proteins and work towards lean proteins like chicken and fish. Limiting foods that are higher in fat, higher in sugar, that are going to add to those those emotional ups and downs. Um, high sugar diets have these peaks and valleys of energy and emotional um, experiences that can add to depression and anxiety. Alcohol can do the same and alcohol can really disrupt your sleeping pattern. And so it's important to keep alcohol at a moderation or if it's not even needed, eliminate it. Uh, actually, it's never really needed, but uh, there is some research that says that uh, a glass of red wine can be helpful um, in the flavonoids, I believe it is. Um, and supplements, making sure that you are checking with your healthcare team on what supplements. Dr. Cole mentioned a bit about this earlier in his talk, that there at least in research um, at the bench, that there can be some concern about how some of the supplements will interact with your myeloma therapy. And then I think key is really activity. Activity helps in so many ways, from the mental uh, restrengthening and physical restrengthening, reducing pain. There are a lot of research um, studies that have shown that neuropathy and bone pain can be reduced through activity. Of course, you have to keep that in mind with what type of activity based on if you have any uh, bone related issues from your myeloma. You also want to be very careful about using the right type of assistive devices if you're having neuropathy or weakness. But core strengthening, 
working with physical therapy, all of these things can enhance your well-being, enhance your immune system. Um, and so going for a walk is a good idea. I think key to my, my message here is that knowledge is power. And I'm so thankful to the IMF that the resources that they've made available in multiple forms, whether it be a meeting like this, through the pre-recorded um, webinars that they have available, and printed materials that they, uh, that they allow you access to free of charge. So I encourage you to, to reach out for any of these materials, as well as their information or info line is available nine to four uh, Pacific time, um, and is a wealth of knowledge. And if they, by chance, don't actually have the answer, which is pretty, pretty rare now, um, they will find the answer for you. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to these um, tips on self empowerment and self-advocacy for both the myeloma survivor and the caregiver. And I think, um, Kelly, if there are any questions or if we're running out of time, happy to move on and, and do the group panel.